please go ahead and take it away, Dr. Okay. So um, <clears throat> I am beyond thrilled that um, you all um, are here at 10 in the morning. Um, I also wanna thank um, Laura Prescott for uh, just following up and being so patient with me. And I can't say enough to Dr. Jackie Taylor who um, invited me to give this particular talk now. Um, I need to give a few um, housekeeping things. Um, I won't be able to look at the chat because I can only see the screen that I'm gonna share with you. Um, and this talk has a lot of moving parts. So there's audio and video um, and a lot of slides, but what I wanna do is um, sort of do an introduction to how sociologists think about race and even adding some implications um, regards to sort of health and health disparities. I, I think um, given the times that we're in, uh, you know, we're coming and experiencing and living through a global pandemic where you know, 600,000 plus people died in this country. We've watched um, a number of protests um, after the murders of people like George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Elijah McClain. Um, and I think even witnessing um, uh, insurrection at the beginning of this year at the Capitol, I say all this to say that these, have, you know, these past few years have been really, really trying. Um, and, and given all of that, um, I remain optimistic. And so this talk and the research that I want to present is uh, just a way of thinking and talking about conversations around issues of race. Um, and I, I also wanna pay an homage to a number of the scholars who have shaped and influenced my thinking. I'm also honored um, for a host of reasons because um, Dr. Taylor's work, Jackie Taylor's work has been very informative in terms of how I think about just the various ways we think about the intersections of race and biology that I think is significant important. So you should check out our work um, in that, those regards. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna get started. Um, and I'm gonna talk for about you know 40 minutes and then I'll take questions. Um, and we'll go from there. All right, I'm gonna share my screen, audio and video. Okay, and from the beginning. All right, so um, the talk, um, which is, I just wanna move some things around. Um, so the talk is a nation divided the high cost of tacit racism in everyday life. And I had the, the great pleasure of working with um, this brilliant social theorist named Ann Warfield Ross, who's at Bentley University, who has a long career of studying troubled interactions. Um, and she comes from a very um, socially justice minded family. She's a daughter of the political philosopher John Rawls. Uh, she was my mentor and advisor at Wayne State University. But what we decided to do um, was to write this book um, that has been something like 18 years in the making um, to really interrogate troubled interactions and why this was so important to me and I speculate to her as well is that what we were witnessing in terms of when communication breaks down um, between um, you know groups of people in this case and communication breaks down and people attribute that breakdown in communication to race, um, that some of these troubled interactions are literally a matter of life and death. Um, and when I say that, imagine what happens between um, citizens and law enforcement when communication breaks down or going to uh, see the doctor and not having your pain taken seriously, um, trouble in the workplace. But I think the wider issue, um, especially given a country with a shared history, a shared language, was that we believe as globalization is rising and countries are doing what's in their best interest, that those divisions within the United States could be exploited by outside powers through social media and what have you. So it was this 
project, this book that really tried to get at not only how people deal with troubled interactions and the implications, but also provide a way out that, you know, it's sort of steeped in optimism that once we address these problems or identify them, that we can systematically work to dismantle them. Um, the goal of this talk, and it's um, very specific, I need to move something. Um, the goal of this talk, um, I really think it's important for us to have a conversation, and I'm a sociologist, and I study um, troubled interactions in neighborhood and institutional settings, everything from autism to food insecurity to neighborhood poverty. But I think for me, it's important to have a conversation about how sociologists think about sort of the cultural understandings of issues around race, that the way that we think about race is not a biological fact, but a social convention, a social fact um, that comes from interactions and this shared history and language, um, and that history is significant. Um, and usually the social constructions of race is often flattened with ancestry and genetics. And so I want to sort of tease out that race, biology, and ancestry are three different different things, but in a Venn diagram, there's some overlap. So I want to talk about how race is socially constructed and really interrogate the meaning of race, blackness and whiteness over time. Um, you know, go through some theories of race and racism within sociology, and then talk about implications from my research, but also for those of you who are health practitioners who are working with um, different populations. Next slide. Okay, these are my 23andMe results. And if you were to um, look at this, um, you can see that, and this is a way that I want to sort of interrogate, um, you know, social constructions of race, biology, and ancestry. So here I identify as a Black American. Um, and according to my, you know, 23andMe results, you know, I'm 82% Sub-Saharan African, 16% European, and 1.4% um, East Asian Native American. And you should be suspicious of me because there's 0.2% uh, <laughs> unassigned. Um, but the, the point here that I want to make is that here, the category of Black American being socially constructed, the ancestry of where people are at this moment in time in terms of, you know, being Nigerian and um, British and Irish and Scandinavian and, you know, First Nation Native American, again, re refers to sort of ancestry. And then the way these categories were constructed um, is a nod to sort of biological markers. In terms of thinking about theories of race and racial formation, um, as a sociologist, and one of the points that I think was really important for this book was for my co-author and I to think about how race has been structured over time, and that there are these sort of shared constitutive practices and expectations. If you can think about constitutive practices as a constitution, you know, both sort of formal and informal rules that people develop um, and that those categories of what it means to be Black American or a white American or Latinx or um, biracial, what does that mean and how it was socially constructed? But pointing out that whiteness was invented in the American colonial context to divide English and Irish from African slaves. And we start witnessing the sanctions and then starting to see that these categories of a black white um, binary begins to be um, a part of law. Um, and what that does, it shapes who can own property, who can vote, um, and who is recognized as a citizen. And so it gives us some indication about who's included and excluded from these categories. But also I think it's really significant and important to think about what it means that we actually had human beings as private property. Um, what I'm interested in and the work and all of my work sort of rest on this idea of an interaction order. Um, and if you can think about an interaction order is how do we learn these relationships? You know, um, how are they recognized? How do we learn these sort of shared expectations and issues around reciprocity? Time is important, um, both this particular historical moment, but also how things have changed. But we need to start thinking about power as well. So how are people rewarded and sanctioned um, and how context matters. And thinking, 
let's talk. That's funny. Um, and thinking about this uh, and the black white binary and thinking about citizenship, uh, about black Americans with the 13th amendment um, of the constitution abolishing slavery. Um, and again, there's always discussion about um, categories of people um, who are left out in terms of how we think about prison populations. The 14th Amendment granting um, citizenship to former slaves or anyone born in the United States, that still has implications today. And then the 15th Amendment granting Black Americans the right to vote. Um, and I, I want to put an asterisk if I bet Black American men, um, because until the 19th Amendment, Black women could not vote. Um, and then we start to see sort of separate but equal uh, with the Plessy versus Ferguson case in 1896. Um, and we don't see changes until the Brown versus Board of Education um, case in 1954 and the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And so when I say, talk about these sort of, um, how these bind, how the binary was constructed and how it is a part of a larger historical process, that's what I'm referring to. Other scholars um, that have informed this work is Michael Omi and Howard would not um, argue that racial formation is a process of situated historical projects of human bodies and social structures to organize people um, around sort of these social categories, economic categories and political forces to determine what is that, what does that mean in the grand scheme of things? How is race lived? What is sort of the economic meaning um, and how it's associated with our economic system? And if you could think about human beings being private property, how that not only shapes things like accounting, um, citizenship, um, a lived experience. Um, and what I mean by that is how do we understand, you know, the value of human bodies and how that has contributed to our understanding of people and place as a country? And what were the sort of the political forces that sort of determined this? And so what Omi and Wanan argues is that race is a, a product of this social process. Now, one of the things that I think is really significant and important is that people often talk and throw categories around like white supremacy. Um, and there are critical race theorists like uh, Francis Lee Ainsley that says that, you know, white supremacy, very similar to the Omi and Wenat argument, is that it's a political, economic, and cultural system that where whites overwhelmingly control power and material resources. Um, but I think in the popular um, imagination, you know, white supremacy tends to be seen as white nationalist group, white supremacist extremist hate groups and alt-right groups. And what I'm saying here is just one way of thinking about this sort of argument is again, how there's sort of this taken for granted notion about whiteness, um, but also that there are these sort of varieties of white supremacy. This other category that I think is really significant um, is this idea of implicit bias. Now, I'm a sociologist. I study interactions, language, and practices. But I'm very much aware that there are these sort of taken for granted unconscious ways of thinking about race as a category. Um, and I think you know, um, when we hear things like implicit bias or critical race theory, uh, I think it becomes muddied and sort of making these distinctions. Um, one of the most exciting things that I was pleased to witness was the confirmation of um, the Attorney General, General Merrick Garland talking with um, or being questioned by Senator Kennedy from Louisiana about implicit bias. And I want to sort of share this clip that will allow me to sort of, you know, pivot with the rest of my talk. Can I ask you about this concept of implicit bias? Yeah. Does that mean I'm a racist no matter what I do or what I think? I'm a racist, but I don't know I'm a racist? Okay, the, the label racist is not one that I would apply uh, like that. Implicit bias just means that every human being <laughs> has biases. That's part of what it means to be a human being. And the point of uh, examining our implicit biases is to bring our conscious mind up to our unconscious mind and to, 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 to know when we're behaving in a stereotyped way. Everybody has stereotypes. It's, it's not possible to go through life without working through stereotypes. And uh, implicit biases are the ones that we don't recognize our behavior. That doesn't 
Let me ask you about this. So, but in, in addition to thinking about implicit bias, as a sociologist and as I'm um, an ethnomethodologist, so I'm really interested in people's methods. And what I'm interested in is the ways that um, language and practices is encoded in everyday life. And so it doesn't matter whether or not we have implicit bias. And I'm not really interested in racist people per se. I'm really interested in practices that are a tribute to racism and how do we dismantle those practices. Um, and I think in everyday life, we draw on a certain set of taking for granted assumptions and social expectations to get us through a lived experience. I want to illustrate this with a point about sayings that have died out over time. Um, but those sayings, you know, once people became aware of how problematic they were, that we stop having or um, stop doing those particular things. In this case, I want to interrogate this, um, this famous catchphrase called free white in 21. Um, that has it's loaded with different types of meaning. But I also think it points to like who historically was considered a citizen who had the right to vote who had the right to own property. You're a free white in 21. You can do as you choose. I don't know why I have to consult you about my friends. I'm free, white, and 21. My name is Danny Churchill. I'm from New York. Free, white, and lonesome. I feel so guilty dragging you into this. You didn't drag me into anything. I'm free, white, and old enough. Come back to stay. I'm trying to get her to, Judge. Because she's got some mighty stubborn ideas. My foreman doesn't approve of my actions. Well, you're free, white, and long about 21. Yesterday. Had a party to prove it. And a few hysterics. Josie, you don't act up, do you? Tell me, have you been playing the market again? Well, what if I have? I'm All the books are getting wet and dirty. I know, everything is getting rusty, including me. You ought to stay busy like I do. I'm free, white, and 21, and I'm going to do what I please. Well, so what? We're all free, white, and 21. For us, too. Why don't you leave Stella alone? She's free, white, and 21, and makes her own choice. Yeah. I'm 21, I'm white, and I have a right to be free. If you're squeamish about words, I'm colored. And if you face facts, I'm a Negro. And if you're a polite Southerner, I'm a Negra. And I'm a nigger if you're not. I'm none of those things, Ralph. A little while ago, you said you were free, white, and 21. That didn't mean anything to you. Just an expression you've heard for a thousand times. Well, to me, it was an arrow in my guts. What, friend? I don't see why I have to tell you everything. I'm free, white, and in my early 40s. Now, what's interesting about that saying is that we probably don't recognize it or hear it or even aware that that was a, a popular saying but i would even go so far as to think about nursery rhymes everything from any mini miny mo um to sort of the origins of how we have reconstructed and reimagined these things but within our book <sighs> We talk about issues um, that people have felt um, not only in everyday life, but in the workplace, um, where you're in a situation where people take for granted you're not supposed to be. And so we did a series of experiments. In one case, we looked at high status Black men and how they talked about that their identities are not recognized. And even going so far to saying that people who report to them actually go above them um, to make sure that the directives that's coming from a supervisor um, is actually authentic. Um, but also, what does that do to a person in a position of power in terms of not um, having your authority recognized? And one of the ways that people have dealt with this in our book was to, you know, personally to sort of avoid people in situations that they have deemed problematic to their ability to do their job. I think the other issue is sort of non-recognition, you know, a situation where people don't recognize who you are as a human being and how, again, that shapes this idea of a fractured reflection. 
The other issue that I think that is often left out in these discussions is this idea called submissive civility. And I want you to think about power that we walk into situations where depending upon who we are, whether it's our, our race, our, our gender, our sexuality, our social class, where we grew up, our age, our uh, ability, um, that any of those things can be points where you can be discriminated against. But here, we often find that people are doing things, you know, just to get through a situation, being complicit and compliant. And this is sort of submissive civility, uh, a temporary conformity to a situation so that you can move on. And in a lot of cases, it can be you know, a matter of life and death. W.B. Du Bois made the argument in the late 1800s that, you know, in a country as diverse as the United States, that there will come a time where, you know, people who have been historically oppressed will actually start to, you know, not only point out that oppression, but also point out that, you know, these narratives about who we should celebrate, who's a citizen, who's a human being, those things are gonna be challenged. But at the same time in thinking about submissive civility, um, one of the sort of key examples um, that I can think of is this um, incident that happened with Philando Castile and his partner, Diamond Reynolds, the police officer and her child in the backseat of the car, where here, um, this woman is watching her partner die, um, trying to keep her um, toddler calm and safe and trying to keep the police officer calm while recording. And what that is in terms of thinking about this as an example of submissive civility, she's being overly complicit and compliant and agreeing with the police officer. Um, but at the same time, she does this sort of liberatory act of recording this interaction that's problematic. And so the idea here is that if things were more equitable, that people would challenge power and authority. And this has somehow, not somehow, but this has been the story for a lot of Black Americans in terms of thinking about power dynamics that we walk in and out of in everyday life. Now, what we propose, and, it, and, it's, um, and it's not um, that challenging, but, you know, we, and when I say we, you know, we have a shared history, a shared language, and a shared culture. And so what does it mean, you know, for white Americans or Americans in general to have a double consciousness about not only, you know, um, what it means to be a person of color um, in this country, but also being able to sympathize and empathize in a way that's much more accurate. And so again, you know, we talk about how this is done by pointing out and paying attention to everyday interactions and working through those interactional troubles. In addition to our argument, there are people like Elijah Anderson, who's at Yale, uh, who talks about places called the white space, um, you know, places in um, locations that have historically excluded um, people of color and women. If we think about a lot of our academic institutions, how they have historically been um, places that did not allow um, women and people of color to attend. And we often forget about how significant, um, you know, not only World War II was in terms of thinking about how academic institutions change, but also the civil rights movement in terms of being inclusive and adding people um, to um, these sort of historically um, exclusionary spaces. Other scholars like Joe Fagan argues that, you know, um, that there is this white racial frame that is sort of a broadening of racial stereotypes, prejudice, imagery, interpretations, narratives that's sort of informing um, this whole idea. So you don't necessarily need, um, and I want to be careful how I said this, white supremacy doesn't need white people to survive, meaning that it's so embedded in the way that we think about language, the way that we think about practices and the way that we think about culture. Again, what we're proposing is sort of a stop and to sort of analyze and study those troubled interactions. Other scholars like Eduardo Bonilla Silva points out, and he was one of the first, and I owe a great debt to this man um, who studied colorblind racism. And he points out that in conversations, there was a way that race has historically been talked about, um, that there's abstract liberalism, um, this idea that government 
the state should not have a role in legislating or using laws or policies to produce racial equity. There's sort of this naturalization hypothesis that racial segregation is a natural phenomenon. Anybody who knows American history speculate and question whether that's true. You know, this idea that there's cultural racism, that, you know, cultural stereotypes. And again, a, a country that has a shared history, a shared language, um, that there's this sort of understanding that there are these different values and sort of this minimization of racism that, you know, those were problems in the past and they're not affecting people anymore. And that too, you know, point out racial disparities is playing the race card. And then this hot bed topic, critical race theory. I think after the uprisings um, of the past two years, I think a lot of organizations started to do diversity and inclusion training. Um, but I think a, a lot of those categories got flattened to critical race theory, which is a legal scholarship that comes from Derek Bell, people like uh, Richard Delgado, Kimberly Crenshaw, Charles Lawrence, Joyce Bell, and Angela Harris. Um, that looks at the connections between race and the law. So, you know, housing policy, education policy, how race is embedded in the constitution, things like affirmative action. These were ways to sort of systematically study um, the relationship of race and the law and providing a historical context for the analysis of those laws and policies. But, and this, if I could, um, if I had one wish um, that I think Black feminist scholars have been very helpful and informative in our understanding of the intersections of race, class, and gender, and how any of those categories can be points of discrimination. And looking at sort of the interlocking nature of oppression, uh, the importance of Black women's culture in terms of understanding not only how Black women have historically been excluded, but how we talk about Black women and women of color historically. Um, and I'm referring to people like Audre Lorde, and Angela Davis and Kimberly Crenshaw um, and Patricia Hill Collins, matrix of domination, theory of difference, intersectionality, that these women are you know, pushing the ball forward in terms of having us think about our sort of lived experience and the standpoint from where we are and how any parts of our identity can sort of be marks of oppression, but also there's something liberatory about marks of understanding. One concept that we develop in this book to sort of discuss um, sort of historical residue, and we call it race pollution, that it has a way of popping up, um, whether with COVID and anti-Asian um, sentiment, um, moments of sort of stereotypes that are steeped in anti-Blackness, the fear of the foreigner with um, xenophobia. Um, after 9-11, watching Islamophobia. I live in Pittsburgh and to witness the devastation from the Tree of Life um, attack and anti-Semitism. But there are these sort of orderliness to how these different forms of race pollution works. And so to again dismantle it, and this is something we need to think about. And what we propose is that it's one thing to understand how your understandings of issues around race and ethnicity is working on an individual level, but also how they play out in everyday interactions. Uh, and not only that, but also the organizations where which we work, but also how these things are informing wider structural issues. <laughs> I do want to talk about what, you know, what's the so what factor and sort of bring this to, um, you know, as a, a group of people who are medical practitioners and just people who live in the world with other um, citizens is thinking about how we've historically have marginalized and done harm and recognizing and understanding that harm to sort of push ourselves forward. Um, this is a um, picture of James Marion Sims, who is often referred to as one of the founders of modern um, gynecology, but the experiments that he performed on Black women and girls uh, without anesthesia and how that has informed um, how people have not only make sense of the medical profession, but everything from the Tuskegee experiments, that there are these 
popular culture things, this historical residue that still impacts our understanding um, and our relationship to the medical profession. But as a sociologist, I think it's also important, and I think for a lot of medical practitioners, and what I try to you know, explain to my students is that there's a whole domain of the social determinants of health, about economic stability, neighborhood and physical environment, education, access to food, um, understanding the social context, but even you know, precarious relationships with you know, the health system, that this all, all of these factors have implications for morbidity, mortality, life expectancy, health, and access. So in addition to that historical residue, even you know, studying and understanding the difference between and within these social determinants of health are significant and important. Um, one of my favorite scholars, um, and she has this wonderful book about sort of the intersection of sort of, you know, genetics and race is Dorothy Roberts, and she, the book is called Fatal Invention. And again, she points out that race is not a biological category that naturally produces health disparities. That again, understanding sort of the social determinants of health, but also the politics behind this of how people have been placed in where they live and their lived experience over time is significant and important. Um, other scholars, um, like Bonner points out that, you know, medical racism is a form of systematic and widespread racism against people of color within the medical system. And I think even, um, you know, I have a PhD, well read, I actually have a degree in uh, community medicine from a medical school, and I still run into um, sort of stereotype language, you know, um, doctors making flippant comments about, you know, you know, I'm, I'm a, you know, primarily a vegetarian, not fully, but um, not eating fried foods or um, that I'm at risk for certain, um, you know, diseases and conditions because I'm black instead of looking at the wider social context and listening to me. But we see this in terms of sort of race-based algorithms, um, thinking about the types of care people receive based on where they live in their racial category, the seriousness of pain, but even in this current moment, you know, of COVID, you know, explaining health literacy, talking about issues of access and trying to build trusting relationships with medical practitioners. These are all areas that need work. Um, and that again, what I hope my work can contribute to is causing us to sort of slow down and think about you know, what's happening in these interactions. Medical doctors, nurses, um, physician assistants, there's a position of power that you're in that people take for granted that the advice that you're giving is in their best interest. But sometimes I think we need to slow down and ask ourselves like how is, you know, and not so much how is, whether people are understanding but recognizing that power dynamic, that asymmetry, that submissive civility that exists um, between medical practitioners and patients, but also recognizing that there's been a lot of harm historically that may prevent people from accessing care. Um, and what I, um, I watched a conversation between Dorothy Roberts and Camilla Jones, and I think one of, um, Camera Jones, um, one of the points that they pointed out that even during COVID, you know, that we see a disproportionate number of, you know, you know, people of color as frontline workers, um, because of residential and educational segregation, limited employment opportunities and discrimination is also shaping how people have access to care. And even once you're infected, how this, you know, shapes, you know, how you're treated, um, especially given, um, these disparities with regards to health around chronic disease and lack of care. And so, and thinking about this interactionally, if I were to sort of make some prescriptions, and I think this is exciting because there are a lot of scholars who have really thought about how do we document, um, you know, the consequences of racism and how do we start to, you know, ameliorate those negative effects. And again, having that discussion, reevaluating, and it's unfortunate that a lot of the courses 
that uh, a lot of medical doctors and um, health practitioners have to go through our STEM courses, but I think the social determinants of health and understanding interactions are extremely important. Um, and thinking about the various ways that sort of race is sort of shaping, you know, people's access to care, um, you know, not only like an access uh, in terms of affording housing, affordable housing, you know, versus public versus private development, um, the legacy of urban renewal in terms of segregation and where people could live and where they couldn't. Um, there's a scholar named Reuben Miller has this book called Halfway Home, um, talking about the impact of criminal records in terms of people's access to care, uh, the legacy of redlining, the shortage of affordable housing and proximity to employment, how restrictive covenants, that these are all the various ways that anti-Blackness and racism has crept up, but it's also shaping where people are at this particular moment in time. So with regards to my work and trying to think about how do we sort of fix these problems, I think it has been really important what I would suggest to you all is sort of listen to, you know, community members and by community members, I mean across the board, you know, spending time both in sort of spaces of, you know, you know, and, you know, spending time in housing projects and, and, you know, different workplaces and religious institutions and community groups, even just meeting people and talking to them on the street, but having a deeper understanding of how people are making sense at a particular historical moment, but also recognizing that a lot of poor communities and particularly a lot of poor black communities have been impacted by drastic changes in welfare reform, public housing, limited um, availability of livable wages, um, changes in public education, displacement, mass incarceration. Um, people have a deep understanding of what their problems are and how to fix those problems. And to play this out, um, I did a project in Pittsburgh uh, with my students to ask people in this community called Homewood Brushton, uh, located in Pittsburgh, um, and I just want to send a shot. I love Pittsburgh. Um, but you know, when I asked people about their communities, that health wasn't just a simple issue. That people were talking about crime and safety and economic development, and education, environment, and land use, and health disparities, and housing, and labor and employment, politics, media, property, restorative justice. I say this all to say that something that may seem <laughs> like a um, that some health issues are tied to wider social issues that we need to have a deeper understanding. So what does this have to do with anything or why should you care? What's the so what factor? As I'm wrapping up this talk, I think one of the things that I think we need to start thinking about is, you know, thinking about um, economic development and health care um, that centers a community needs um, and across the board, across the lifespan, um, whether it's elderly populations, the most vulnerable age between 16 and 24, thinking about political representation for these populations, thinking about housing and security in terms of co-ops and property ownership and community benefits agreements for people who've been displaced and people who remain in these places. In closing, I want to play um, this last clip, um, and this is a, a, a reading of Audre Lorde's um, Hierarchy of Oppression. And it's a way of thinking about how intersecting identities work, but also um, how if we can figure out how to address these issues, how we can have a path forward. Um, and so after I play this clip, I'll stop and I'll take questions and go from there. There is no hierarchy of oppressions by Audre Lorde. I was born black and a woman. I am trying to become the strongest person I can become, to live the life I have been given, and to help affect change toward a livable future for this earth and for my children. As a black, lesbian, feminist, socialist, poet, mother of two, including one boy and member of an interracial couple, I usually find myself part of some group in which the majority defines me as deviant, difficult, inferior, or just plain wrong. From my membership in all of these groups, I have learned that oppression and the intolerance of difference come in all shapes and sizes and colors and sexualities, 
and that among those of us who share the goals of liberation and a workable future for our children, there can be no hierarchies of oppression. I have learned that sexism, a belief in the inherent superiority of one sex over all others and thereby its right to dominance, and heterosexism, a belief in the inherent superiority of one pattern of loving over all others and thereby its right to dominance, both arise from the same source as racism, a belief in the inherent superiority of one race over all others and thereby its right to dominance. Oh, says a voice from the black community, but being black is normal. Well, I and many black people of my age can remember grimly the days when it didn't used to be. I simply do not believe that one aspect of myself can possibly profit from the oppression of another part of my identity. I know that my people cannot possibly profit from the oppression of any other group which seeks the right to peaceful existence. Rather, we diminish ourselves by denying to others what we have shed blood to obtain for our children. And those children need to learn that they do not have to become like each other in order to work together for a future they will all share. The increasing attacks upon lesbians and gay men are only an introduction to the increasing attacks upon all black people. For wherever oppression manifests itself in this country, black people are potential victims. And it is a standard of right-wing cynicism to encourage members of oppressed groups to act against each other. And so long as we are divided because of our particular identities, we cannot join together in effective political action. Within the lesbian community, I am black, and within the black community, I am a lesbian. Any attack against black people is a lesbian and gay issue because I and thousands of other black women are part of the lesbian community. Any attack against lesbians and gays is a black issue because thousands of lesbians and gay men are black. There is no hierarchy of oppression. So I'm gonna stop there and I'll read your chat and I'll take, uh, yes, there, I did not know. <laughs> um, oh, oh. Thank you so much, Dr. Dutch, for this wonderful and powerful talk as, you know, as I always, yeah, I've been a witness to your, your great work in the past, but I'm so glad that you had the opportunity to share that with our community here today. I'll start with the first question, if, okay. you know, if I can take that luxury, and then we'll take some more questions from the audience. I'm really struck by the concept of submissive civility that mm -hmm. you discussed in your book. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I think it's important to highlight is and I wanted you to, you know, expand on this a little bit more, if you can, how those power dynamics may manifest even in academia, because most of the people here are either, you know, faculty, staff, students in some type of academic space, particularly for junior faculty of color. How do you think those um, dynamics of submissive civility have you seen play out? So this is a, I, I you know, this actually, that example is a, a perfect example. Um, there's a part of uh, the academic process, the whole tenure process, that I think is significant and um, important in thinking about what it means to be a junior faculty member um, who's on probation essentially for seven years, where depending upon how large your department is in terms of senior professors, that you have anywhere from 10 to 20 people who have power over you. And thinking about how um, in, in, to have a career that in some cases you might have to be complicit and compliant um, in your own degradation or oppression. So ignoring um, comments, um, you know, um, being judged by a different standard, um, and the assumption that you know that if you make it through this, that you'll have power to sort of challenge that. I think in sort of using a personal example. And I think we're witnessing this uh, all over the country that, you know, um, I've, I've seen this at a number of institutions where there's uh, a group of senior professors who, um, for a host of reasons, may have been able to get a job with their dissertations, um, you know, were, you know, were grants and but they have a different understanding of what the expectations are now in terms of publishing, um, service, research and teaching. 
I, I say all of this to say is that there, you know, in some cases, what I've witnessed um, that because an older generation suffer, that they want to project that suffering onto junior faculty. Um, and I think the pushback, you know, that I think is happening is that people are actually questioning, you know, um, you know, why am I being forced or put in a situation where I can't speak up or speak out for fear of losing my job? And I think this is across the board. It's the, the situation between, you know, professors and students, um, junior faculty and senior faculty. And then the challenge becomes that once you get tenure, that you find out that these are sort of wider structural issues, that, you know, the reason this oppression can exist is because there are institutional practices that have allowed people to um, mistreat um, others. And so even when you try to combat it, <laughs> you're not only you know, challenging your colleagues, um, and now you have to challenge the institution. And then the other downside to this is that there are very few avenues that you have as a junior faculty member to sort of protect yourself. There is the Title IX office. Um, you can file a racial complaint, but it has to be done within you know, a certain time period. And so you are by definition in this very vulnerable and precarious situation as a junior faculty, and you're supervised in a very unnatural way by a host of people People, and then this whole period of being on probation for X amount of years. And then if it doesn't work out, the implications for your career. And so submissive civility is working in those dynamics. And it also comes up, you know, again, the reason I played that hierarchy of oppression clip, that any parts of your identity can be ways that people can, you know, um, sort of willpower over you that target um, um, that is very gendered, that's very racialized, that's very classist, that's very elitist. Um, and so those are that dynamic that's embedded in the structure, but also how it plays out interactionally, I think is significant and important and thinking about submissive civility um, and what paths and avenues do you have to sort of push back and challenge it. I don't know if that made sense. Yes, it makes absolute sense. Thank you so much for expanding on that idea. I'll Love to have uh, questions from the audience. I can continue to ask questions, but I don't want to take up all of your time. Um, I have the liberty of calling Dr. Duck on the phone and talking about these, <laughs> these topics. And, so, you know, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I'm open. You can ask me. Uh, go, go right ahead. Okay. Well, I. Oh, Teresa Palmer, I see you're talking, but you're muted. Hello. <laughs> You're muted. Muted. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Hello. Oh, so I just had a comment on, and you know, because I was so, I have also, I mean, I feel like I've been reading for 30 years, but I have never heard the term submissive civility either. And I thought we watched it an incredible example of it where Merrick Garland could not tell the truth to that senator. Oh, that would have been explosive if he'd said, yes, sir, you are racist. And, and we need to like, we need to flush that out. Does it mean really, I mean, it sounds crazy, but it doesn't mean you're a bad person. You grew up in a racist culture. We're all racist. It's something we have to unlearn. But I was like, I was holding my breath, like, is he gonna how is he going to answer this question? Because that would have been amazing. And we. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, I mean, one of the, the challenges, and I think, you know, I am a work in progress. I'm constantly. Um, aware of my presentation of self and particularly how I treat people and I'm aware of the, the power dynamics. And I, I say this all to say that focusing on practices instead of racist people um, becomes extremely important um, in terms of identifying how it you know, systematically plays out in interpersonal communication, how it's embedded in our organizations, um, and, but also how do we put forth policies in terms of structural issues that it, it, it you know, it hurts to the bone for people to be called racist. It hurts to the bone to be called sexist. It hurts to the bone for some people to be called homophobic. But being aware that there are things that we've been systematically taught 
um, and, you know, and trying to bring awareness to that, to, you know, to say, you know, why are we doing these policies? Why are we saying these things? Why are, you know, why is it difficult to have, you know, these conversations? Um, and so I think that, you know, the, the first step, I, I think, and I think you did a wonderful job is that, you know, again, being able to sort of explain, but the fact that they're having this conversation, I think is powerful in and of itself. And I, you know, I, I do think that these, you know, concepts, concepts about teachable moments, I do think this is important. And I think that exchange has been extremely helpful because that's a popular question. So because I have implicit, does that make me a racist? Um, I think the way that he went about it, I think is, uh, <laughs> It's <laughs> interesting. So it said me scrubbing my social media prior to a job search. Yes, I mean, I think we um, do, um, you know, these things, even with your family members, you know, my mom, you know, I have older relatives who have, you know, very sort of dated notions about things and are, um, you know, unwilling to change. And a lot of things they complain about that they can't say or do are just problematic. Um, and so being able to say, you know, um, you know to, to, to being able to have those relationships. And I, you know, I've been really fortunate and I'm extremely grateful to um, the Black women and girls who have, you know, pointed out even ways that I may have been misogynistic or problematic and how that has benefited, you know, that once I became aware um, and the way that I was writing or talking or interacting, um, I stopped doing it. Um, and, you know, and there's still points of growth, but, you know, this is how we evolve. I, you know, the fact that you know, <laughs> we're constantly changing, and I think we're changing for the better. I, I taught for the first time in two years face-to-face -face yesterday, and I'm constantly impressed with how amazing young people are and their capacity for change. Um, but I'm also aware that we are all operating within a structure that has this very problematic history that we can learn and benefit from. Uh, Dr. Waverly, thank you so much uh, for, for being here. Uh, this has been a wonderful, wonderful uh, talk. Um, I just wondered if you could share your thoughts about uh, th this cancel culture. Mm -hmm. uh, in which you 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 actually uh, can't make a mistake. I mean, you're not allowed to uh, make a mistake, and and some of it's because of the um, the ongoing historical kinds of things that that we have experienced that the uh, the vulnerable and uh, populations and uh, BIPOC individuals have have faced, and uh, and so it's it's like. Uh, Time's up, you know, I'm not taking this anymore. I mean, how do you, but how do you respond? How do you bring people together now in this atmosphere? Okay. I love this question because it's something I'm working through. So I believe, you know, when I tell my students that, you know, you all are some of the most amazing young people. You have access to more information than we've ever had in human history. Um, there's a, a global way of communicating, but the internet never forgets. And there, in one instance, there is this very democratic process where anyone can respond to a person and by anyone it could be anyone in your local community anyone in society anyone from all over the world so you're have this sort of hyper surveillance um, that you're under and if you think about it you know young people are so and i don't mean vulnerable as a weakness but as you're growing up and i'm and i'm personally concerned about young people between the ages of 14 and 26, because this is where substance abuse, you know, suicide, violence, all types of things that um, causes an early, um, early death. And recognizing that there should be a space and a place for redemption and forgiveness, and recognizing that we all make mistakes. Um, and, you know, thinking about, and this is the other part of the book, a path called the repair. 
how do you sort of repair, um, you know, a grievance? And, you know, and how, you know, the right to be forgotten, you know, for problems. I, I'm in my, my mid forties, but I was a ridiculous human being when I was younger. I can't even imagine uh, what my life would be like if I had um, social media and as a tool. And so in one instance, the, the beauty of it is that it's, it's this process where you can do a lot of good and voices that have historically been excluded um, can be included. But it's also that, you know, some people are more vulnerable than others. And so you can, you know, some people can weather being canceled. Some people are uncancelable. Like there are people in our society who, you know, um, you just take it for granted that this is a very problematic and fraught person um, and you understand it. And so I, to answer your question, I think it's great that people have a right to respond and say things. Where those comments are coming from um, can be both positive and negative that people who systematically want to do you harm, but also systematically want to do uh, the country harm as a whole. Um, I think as people are developing, they're going to make mistakes. So there should be a path for forgiveness and repair. And I think the sort of the wider issue is, you know, recognizing that, you know, BIPOC populations um, working class populations, people who are economically marginalized, um, are really vulnerable to the consequences of cancel culture. And so I think realizing that this is sort of the sliding scale, that it both comes with positive and negatives, and trying to figure out what is the path forward? How do we create a culture of forgiveness? And not so much about truth and reconciliation, but recognizing that in situations, there are no time for analysis. I, even to this day, when people say something um, problematic to me, I'm often shocked and I can't process it in that moment. And I'm trying to unpack why I'm having that emotional response. And so again, I, I think this is just a moment in time that we're in that we're going to work through it because we all make mistakes <laughs> and um, and the severity of those mistakes and where you are. Um, I think there there has to come with a, a, a era of um, understanding and forgiveness. And the, the problem is sort of the intersections of, you know, social media and institutions and looking, you know, you know, because there's such a surplus of talent, looking for anything to discredit people becomes um, sort of a tool of getting rid of or marginalizing vulnerable populations. That was a lot I said. I hope it makes sense. Thank you so much. It um, did. Thank you. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, we could continue this conversation. I'm so glad that all of you have, have stayed to the end. I could talk more. I have lots of questions written down here that I wanted to ask you, Waverly, but it'll have to wait until next time. Maybe we will have the pleasure of having you come back and talk to us. I, I would love that. And um, to share some of like the actual data from the study, because we did video and audio recordings to show um, what happens when interactions fall apart and come together. Um, but also, I just want to say again, Again, um, thank you all for making time in your busy schedules and coming out on a Thursday morning to hear me speak. I am beyond honored and I'm extremely grateful. So thank you. And then I also wanted to uh, make an announcement that if any of you are interested in a copy of Dr. Waverly Duck's book, please um, send us an email. It's in the chat to the CRPC and we will make sure that we get a copy to you. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. And I look forward to um, you attending our future talks as well. And thank you so much thank to you. our speaker, Dr. Depp. Thank you. Awesome. Have a great day. Okay. Oops, I lost the chat. Uh, let's Thank you.